Welcome to 30 Minute Reviews. I am Adam. Um, usually we do movie reviews um, on this podcast. Um, that would be how we would typically you know, do it. We've been doing that format for a long time. But every once in a while, we get video game reviews as well. Um, but first, before we go into that, let's talk about this week's top story. Um, so, if you follow Twitter, like I do, I'm very active on Twitter... Um, every few weeks, it seems, since the pandemic has started, there has been some kind of think piece that has come out that has said that Warner Brothers does not know how to handle Superman as a character. Um, which doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, and number one, I don't know why I have to keep retreading the same information, because it's like, it's not like they, like, three weeks pass, and all of a sudden, boom, they know what they're gonna do with the character now. Um... So, one of the things that's happened is now it's because of, you know, the Snyder Cut and because Henry Cavill's role is being talked about um, in the future of the DC Universe, how do we play into this? Um, Now, I have an article Mm -hmm. coming out later today which is going to go into detail about how I would do a Superman movie and what what I would do. I'm going to, you know, talk about that less, but I really want to talk about the fact that I think it's immensely ridiculous that people think we should relegate the character to a Hulk role. Because let's talk about why the Hulk has the role that he does in the Marvel Universe. I'm not talking about the Marvel Comics Universe, I'm talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the Hulk only has this supporting role that he has where he can't headline his own movie because of legal issues. Um, Because of the contract with Universal in perpetuity, Marvel can't make a solo Hulk movie. Hulk needs to be added in other places. Um... So, when, um, so because, because of all of that, we can't really have the Hulk leading his own movie, but even if you look at what the Hulk does, he's not just a flying brick who comes Mm -hmm. in in the Avengers movies, or in a crossover to lend Mm -hmm. himself as an extra muscle to help fight the bad guy. He still has a multi-movie arc, especially when we get from Ragnarok to Infinity War to Endgame. We have this multi-picture arc where the Hulk, where Banner comes to terms with this other part of himself and, you know, it, it comes, I mean, it's not exactly beautifully laid out on screen, but it's there. Now, and the thought of relegating Superman to this role is kind of silly, I think, um, because there is no reason why, like, there's no structural reason as to why that needs to happen, unless they're so committed to keeping Henry Cavill in the role, which I think a lot of people like him in the role. I, I, I if he was a well-done Superman, I think he could do it well. Like, if Henry Cavill was given the scripts that, um, what's his name had? Um, that, um, Tyler Hoechlin had on Supergirl, um, he'd be the best Superman that we've had. Um... I think, but he, he hasn't had that opportunity yet. And again, I'm not knocking Snyder's version of Superman. I'm saying that Snyder's version of Superman is, you know, it, it, it's a take. It's a take on the character. I may not agree with the take, but I'm not going to fault it because I would do it differently because that's not how you should review... Like, I, I, I'm firm with the belief that if you're going to review something, you shouldn't talk about how I... like. If I were writing it, this is how I would do it. And then because it doesn't line up exactly with my method, that takes mm-hmm. off points. Now, it's different if it's like there's a more interesting take here or if it's a, a weird story decision. But in this case, that's not what that's not what's happening. What's happening is we have, you know, Superman being... I don't know. Uh, here's the other thing with this whole situation. Making Superman timely. Um, people who don't know how to make Superman timely are just not really thinking about it as... are thinking about comic book movies as action movies. I think that's the big the big issue here, is that we think of comic book, comic book movies as action movies that are tinged with something else. And if you look at Marvel, Marvel's kind of helped out with this, where you have the heist-tinged um, action movie, or, hi, like, heist, heist-flavored. heist It's like the LaCroix of movies, where it's like, there's a taste... Of an action movie. Uh, there's a, there's a, no, the taste of a political thriller in The Winter Soldier. The taste of science fiction. Um, Star Wars as science fiction in Guardians of the Galaxy. There's a taste of heist in Ant-Man. There's a taste 
of like a chase movie. Like I think of a, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Um, in um, the uh, in Ant Man and the Wasp, um, especially get to the climax. I really like that movie actually. Um, but you 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 get a taste of of what the movie is uh, of of like a genre, of a genre picture, but you don't really get a full a full a full you know. It's not something that's eating, you know, the full... Like, drinking a strawberry LaCroix and eating a strawberry is not the same thing. Um, because at the end of the day, it's still a superhero movie. That just happens to have a slight tinge to it in terms of, you know, for, for taste. Now, with a Superman movie, mm-hmm. it allows you to explore what it would be like to tell the story from a different perspective. Not in a Joker kind of way, where if I were to do it, I wouldn't do a Lex Luthor movie... I would keep Lex as the villain. Um, mm-hmm. But really, if you break down, to me, the core of the relationship between Lex and Superman is over the notion of who the man of tomorrow is. Lex believes himself to be the man of tomorrow. He's what hum- he thinks humanity should be in the future. And because Lex thinks that about himself, the the fact that this alien comes around and now this alien is, you know, it, is taking that role from him, then... That that makes him insecure, and that makes him need to fight Superman. So you could do a Lex Luthor movie, and have Superman be the bad guy or the antagonist. Um, but I think the more interesting way to do it is to do like Supergirl season four. Now in Supergirl season four, one of the bad guys who was you know puppeted by Lex a little bit was Agent Liberty, who is a race baiting xenophobic bigot who uh, hates aliens and gets people in a in, in like in a furor over aliens on Earth, and turns the perception of humanity against aliens. And the way that Kara defeats him and defeats uh, Lex is through her reporting because she's a reporter. And I think that's an interesting way to kind of handle the situation. Mm-hmm. And, and because it was used through her reporting that she won, and that she beat him. It, it was about her using mm-hmm. her defeating him in a very human way, and with Superman you have that same kind of way of doing it. You can flip the script, and if you make Superman into you know the underdog in this way, where it's the public perceptions against Superman, where Lux has made the public afraid of him and afraid of what he can mm-hmm. do, and this is something they could have done in Batman v Superman. It would have worked a lot better, I think, than what we got. Um. It's just like, instead of saying that humanity was inherently afraid of someone who, you know, drapes mm-hmm. himself in the American mm-hmm. flag, calls himself American, fights for truth just in the American way, and then the public is afraid of him innately out of the gate, I get it. I, I get that they're afraid of someone with these powers and, and they're hesitant to, to do it. It make, it does make sense, but I feel like if we're going to go into a, a universe of fantasy where, you know, Superman can even exist to begin with, you can, you can say... The public's with him, and then Lex makes him look bad. Lex frames him. Um, gets some discount Ben Shapiro and throw him in there, which Sam Witwer does a great job playing uh, Dollar Store Ben Shapiro, and it's, it's kind of mm-hmm. hilarious. Um, but um, I, I, that would be the way I would do a Superman movie. And when you do it that way, it allows you to explore so much more of the character and, and so much more of what makes him Superman which is his inherent goodness. He is, and, and we, we sit here and you always see the thing, it's like, oh, people wouldn't buy seeing a movie about a person who has the Boy Scout personality. That's not true because I've watched three Captain America movies and four Avengers movies where Steve Rogers is the Boy Scout that he, he's meant to be. Um, and, and he should, uh, what's it called? Um, if we can buy into that to the point where he is so good, so, you know, like... When you when you in that first Captain America movie, one of the things that epitomizes the character is when he's talking to Stanley Tucci's character, whose name for uh, Doctor er- uh, Erskine, and he says, um, "I'm not looking for a good soldier. I'm looking for a good man." And that's what Steve Rogers is. He's a good man who goes out of his way to do what's right and fight for the little guy. Um, there's a line in X Men Apocalypse that's similar, and when I think of Superman, I think of this this line, even though Charles Xavier, who's not the right person to say it, says it. And those of you with the greatest power fight for those who don't. That's who Superman is. He's someone who does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. There's no moral quandary over whether or not he's doing the right thing. He knows what's right. 
he does what's right. And he he's not a, he, that's who he is because it's the right thing to do. Um, truth, just in the American way. Um, so, if you have an issue with a Superman movie, Warner Brothers, I'm free. I, I have nothing going on. I can give you a hand with this. Um, I, I'm I can I can help you out. I can give you a few outlines. Give me a call. Um, also, Rogues, but that's not the point. Um, so, this brings us to this week's review. We're going to talk about um, the um, Isle of Armor, which is the DLC for Pokemon Sword and Shield. Um, if you have Pokemon Sword and Shield, you know that there's a $30 DLC package. It's two DLCs that has come out. Um, so, the DLC announcement has been met with derision. Um, for reasons I don't quite understand. Um, now, this week I also have an article about, um, toxicity in fandom and how toxic fandom can influence your ability to like or dislike a piece of media, um, based on if other people like or dislike it. But that, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, this, this comes to mind though, because the, there's a lot of toxicity around Sword and Shield. Um, here's the thing. I'm on board with the DLC plan, and let me tell you why. If they were going to do the traditional method of um, releasing Pokemon games, like they used to, I would be paying $120 to play the two base games and then a third version of the game, which would have like an, uh, one area added on. Um, look historically at what we've gotten in the past. Um, Crystal, modified story for Suicune. Um, the ability to, the, the battle tower, and the ability to, uh, what's it called, pick boy or girl. Uh, look at Yellow, uh, Pikachu follows behind you, modified story to match. Uh, Jesse and James are characters that you encounter throughout the game. Um, like that. Emerald, you get, in, there are a few new caves, Battle Frontier. Um, New Eras of Safari Zone, all that good stuff. Um, Platinum, story upgrade, New Areas, Battle Frontier, again, like that. Uh, Black 2, White 2, New Areas, all that kind of good stuff. So, basically that's what we're adding on here. We're adding in new Pokemon are available in the game. We have new, um, Mm -hmm. what's it called? New, uh, new Pokemon being added in. <clears throat> and a bunch of stuff like that. Um, so, that's what we're getting here with not one, but the two DLCs in this $30 DLC pack. The first one, Isle of uh, Armor, which came out yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. It's deep. It's a huge area. It's probably the biggest area added in, in what we would consider the third version of the game. Out of any game that we've had so far. Um... The most new stuff, most new story, uh, new Pokemon, new everything. It feels new, like different. Um, that is <clears throat> that is uh, what makes this kind of like unique in a way. Is that we're getting all of this now, and we're paying what would be what would amount to thirteen dollars, uh, fifteen dollars. So we're splitting up among two, and then we have a second one coming. Um, it's not all great. I like what I'm doing so far. It's kind of fun. It's basically one big wild area with a story that you can go around. And it feels kind of like a tech demo, in a way, um, for how they could do this in the future. This generation feels very test. Um, I would just say testy. Um, but it feels like they're, they're testing out what they can do and how they can make this work. And I understand that you're going to get the arguments that, oh, fan games have been doing this for years and all of that. But they can't look to fan games for how to operate their game because then the fan games are like, oh, well, you stole our idea, and then there's that, and then... No. They need to test it out for themselves and figure out how to do it. So what they're doing now is this is them testing out an open-world Pokemon game. We can go wherever you want. So that all happens with this new, with this new release. I don't like this Diglett thing 
this, they need to find the Diglets because much like the red coin, uh, the blue coins in Super Mario Sunshine, there's no way to really track it, and it's hard to keep track of what you have and what you're missing and all of that. Um, they didn't really lay out a reward for doing it, um, and this first DLC feels kind of light. Like it feels like they put this out first, and then the second one's gonna be more like heavier. Um, I haven't gotten too far into it yet. I'm still trying to find the max mushrooms, but I've been exploring the wild area a lot, and the wild area feels big but empty. Um, where we're looking around, and there's a lot like there's a lot of Pokemon to encounter. Not that many though at the same time, um, and it, it's interesting to see how that plays out. Um, so. Here's the thing. If you're on the fence about buying this and you have Pokemon Sword already or Pokemon Shield already, I would hold off. I would hold off until the uh, Arctic Tundra or the um, the Crown Tundra comes out. Because I, want, I, I would wait to see if both of them are worth it for $30. Granted, if you look at it the way I do, where the simple act of paying... Instead of paying the full, you know, full retail again for a game and then getting to that at the end, we're basically, mm-hmm. in an alternate world, I could see them doing that. Where this year, instead of getting uh, the DLC split up, they would have released uh, Sword, uh, Sword, uh, Sword Plus and Shield Plus, or whatever you want to call it, um, where you get, you know that and then their region their version exclusives mm-hmm. or you get both and it's like you gotta play through the entire story again and i would rather just pay 30 dollars and not to pay through, play through the entire story again instead of paying 60 to play through the story i already played through and then get to the new area um so i hope this sticks around i just hope the quality gets better um so yeah so i guess i'll wrap up there for today um if you're on the fence about it wait until Crown Tundra comes out later this year. Um, if you if you liked Sword and Shield, if you liked the wild area, I would get this because it's just more of the wild area. It's huge. There's a lot of areas to explore and a lot of Pokemon coming back. It's really cool. Um, the legends don't come back until Arctic Tundra. Uh, I'm actually saying Arctic Tundra, Crown Tundra. The neither do the uh, anything else like that. Uh, the fossils or anything. Um, so that'll be cool. Uh, one of the pieces of news, Pokemon Go will be adding Mega Evolution at some point this year. Not entirely sure how that's going to work. I feel like it's going to work with Candy during battle. Um, if I were to venture against Candy and Stardust. Um, but I feel like this is a step in the right direction. Um, at some point, hopefully, we get Kecleon, though. Um, still haven't gotten that yet. Um, but until then, let's hope for the best. If you have not... Uh, until the end of the day today, there is Galarian, mm-hmm. Farfetch, the Pokemon Go, and the next event is the Solstice event. So, get on that. And we'll be back next week with another episode. We will be doing another movie. I'm going to pick one out later today, uh, and we will see where we go from there. And so, until then, have a great rest of your week.